Welcome to the channel, Brainiacs. For those new here, my name is Dr. Martin Rudkowski, and I'm an assistant professor of neurosurgery with expertise in brain tumors. Today begins the first of a two-part operative video series entitled Operating Inside the Spinal Cord. In part one, we'll review the basic anatomy of the spinal cord, why and how we access the spinal cord safely, and I'll show you a video illustration of a case where I operated inside a woman's cervical spinal cord to remove a vascular malformation known as a cavernous malformation. In part two, I'll take you inside the operating room with me and show you what the spinal cord looks like, including the patient's cavernous malformation and the steps I performed to remove it safely and without causing her any new neurological problems or deficits. Feel free to jump forward to the animated illustration later in this video, but for those who are curious, let's discuss some background on spine surgery, spinal cord anatomy, and this particular patient's case. It's important to note that while spine surgery is a fundamental specialty within neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery, true surgery on the spinal cord itself is quite rare. Spine surgery most often refers to operations on the spinal column itself, specifically the bones known as vertebra that house and protect the spinal cord. In general, spine surgery is performed for degenerative conditions, deformity, and traumatic conditions such as fractures, dislocations, and spinal cord injury. Bone tumors and nerve tumors adjacent to the spinal cord are also a part of spine surgery, although these tend to be rare. Furthermore, neurosurgeons specializing in spine, tumors, and vascular neurosurgery can all be involved in operations on the spinal cord itself, depending on the suspected problem and pathology. The technical skills required differ slightly when it comes to spinal column surgery versus spinal cord surgery. Spinal column surgery, performed for degenerative conditions such as spinal arthritis, slippage or listhesis of spinal vertebra, and fractures or trauma, typically involves decompression of the spinal cord or spinal nerves by removing part or all of the intervertebral discs or drilling and reshaping the bony anatomy of the spinal vertebra, often with the addition of spinal instrumentation such as inner body cages or spacers meant to replace the function of removed discs and placement of hardware including screws and rods to provide strength and facilitate bony fusion and stability. Spinal deformity surgery is most commonly carried out for scoliosis and severe degenerative conditions that not only cause compression of the spinal cord and spinal nerves, but severe malalignment and migration of bony elements of the spinal canal that can result in severe pain, decreased function, and cosmetic deformity itself. Severe and abnormal curvatures of the neck and back are commonly fixed by spinal deformity surgeons, as well as conditions that affect the junction of the head and neck, known as the craniocervical junction, in which the skull does not sit correctly on top of the spinal column. We can even fix some of these craniocervical issues by approaching the spine with a camera through the nose or mouth, something I do in my own practice, but more on that in future videos. So when discussing spine surgery, there's quite a bit of nuance. While spine surgery for degenerative, traumatic, and deformity conditions was a major part of my training, I participate in those surgeries much less commonly now that my practice is focused almost exclusively on brain tumors. However, I do often have the opportunity to operate on spinal cord tumors, which can involve a similar technical skill set of working under a microscope with mechanical instrumentation and focusing on judicious and meticulous dissection and removal of lesions such as tumors and vascular malformations that arise and involve the tissue of the spinal cord itself. In this case, I inherited a patient who had a known cavernous malformation of the cervical spinal cord and its ventrolateral region at the cervical three and four levels of the spinal cord. Unlike the brain, where there can be a surprising degree of redundancy and plasticity within discrete regions, the entirety of the spinal cord is eloquent. Eloquence is a term that we use in neurosurgery to define areas of the central nervous system that have a unique and defined function that when compromised either from a disease or from surgical manipulation can lead to demonstrable and significant deficits or problems in a patient's neurological functioning. Understanding the anatomy of the spinal cord allows us to operate within its tissues to a certain degree and minimize the possibility of postoperative neurological deficits. When I evaluate a patient and lesion involving the spinal cord itself, it is important to differentiate whether the problem is inherently infiltrative, by which I mean the pathology inherently disrupts the fiber pathways of the spinal cord through direct and literal disintegration, versus a lesion which displaces fibers and structures 
allowing us a surgical window that minimizes risk to normal spinal cord function. For example, a cancer that involves the spinal cord itself will by definition invade into normal tissues and make complete removal impossible without also removing critical normal structures. However, benign lesions, such as a cavernous malformation, displace normal tissues and tracts and allow us to enter and remove a lesion with minimal manipulation of the spinal cord. A cavernous malformation can be thought of as a misshapen ball of leaky capillaries. Normally, arteries gradually winnow down into arterioles and then capillaries, where oxygen is delivered to healthy tissues, before capillaries enlarge into venules and veins and return back to the heart. In some patients, for reasons we do not entirely understand, their capillaries are not formed correctly and this linear relationship is disrupted. The ball of malformed or dysplastic capillaries is prone to rupture, which can cause bleeding or hemorrhage with obvious consequences to any tissues in the vicinity. Cavernous malformations can occur in the brain or spinal cord, where hemorrhage places the function of adjacent neurons at significant risk. In this patient, her cavernous malformation within the ventrolateral spinal cord showed evidence of repeated hemorrhages and enlargement. While she did not have significant neurological deficits, the dangers of repeated hemorrhages in this location would include paralysis, breathing difficulty, and potential sensory loss if it was allowed to continue to enlarge, significant deficits that could put her quality of life and life itself at risk. Surgery on the spinal cord itself is typically a last resort option. In this case, it was clear that this patient required operative intervention. Before doing so, however, it is important to understand the basic anatomy of the spinal cord. The spinal cord extends from the foramen magnum, which is the large hole at the base of the skull that connects the lower brainstem to the upper spinal cord, down to the conus medullaris, which is the tapered end of the spinal cord, roughly at the level of the lumbar one and lumbar two vertebra. Beyond this exists the cauda equina, which is a cluster of nerve roots emanating from the conus and extending out through the lumbosacral spine into the pelvis, abdomen, and lower extremities. There are 31 total segments of the spinal cord, including eight cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and one coccygeal, each with a pair of nerve roots. There are ventral and dorsal nerve rootlets that possess motor and sensory functions respectively, and combine to create peripheral nerves. Within the spinal cord itself, there's gray matter and white matter, but in an inverted configuration when compared to the brain. White matter completely surrounds central gray matter within the spinal cord, consistent with its main function of transmitting information to and from the body and brain. The central gray matter assumes an H-shaped structure comprised of horns, including the dorsal and ventral horns bilaterally, which have specific organization based on afferent, aka input information, and efferent, aka output information. While there are several classification systems of spinal cord gray matter, it's easiest to think of the dorsal and ventral horns in terms of their function. The true scope of this topic honestly goes beyond what I can cover in this video. But much like the brain, the spinal cord can be divided into two halves, demarcated by the anterior median fissure, which is a cleft in the ventral cord, and the posterior median sulcus, which is a cleft in the dorsal cord. The white matter of the spinal cord, which surrounds the gray matter almost circumferentially, includes the paired posterior, lateral, and anterior tracts. Tracts within the spinal cord can be divided into ascending or descending functions. In general, ascending tracts transmit information from the peripheral nervous system and body to the brain, including sensory information that enters the dorsal rootlets. Major pathways include the dorsal columns pathway, which transmits information specific to proprioception, vibration, and discriminatory touch. Another major tract includes the spinothalamic tract, which transmits pain, temperature, and light touch. There are several descending tracts, which transmit information from the brain to the peripheral nervous system and body, including, most prominently and most pertinent to this case, the corticospinal tract, which originates in the brain where neurons send most synapses to the ventral horn of the gray matter, with subsequent neurons sending information through the ventral rootlets into peripheral nerves that predominantly control motor or strength functions. Now that we've completely geeked out and established a background for basic spinal cord anatomy, let's get into the particulars of this patient's case. As I mentioned, she suffered from a cervical cavernous malformation at the C3-4 level and her ventrolateral cord, 
Although directly adjacent to the corticospinal tracts, her lack of significant preoperative weakness indicated that these tracts were likely displaced rather than intimately involved with the cavernous malformation and its surrounding hemorrhage. Importantly, the hemorrhage caused by the cavernous malformation had made its way to the surface of the spinal cord, giving me a direct avenue to remove or resect this lesion without going through or transgressing spinal cord tracts themselves. This is a significant factor that determines the safety of an operation. However, it is important to note that basic manipulation of the spinal cord itself puts its essential functions at risk. Furthermore, operating inside the spinal cord can lead to a stroke that can similarly cause permanent disability. In this instance, I approach this patient's cervical cavernous malformation from the back. While it may seem counterintuitive to approach a lesion on the ventral surface of the spinal cord from a dorsal approach, you need to consider the morbidity associated with an approach through the front of the neck. Morbidity is a term that we use in medicine to describe complications that can be associated with any intervention, such as an operation. Accessing the front of the cervical spine would involve a long reach through the structures of the neck. Furthermore, this would require extensive drilling of the vertebral bodies, the most ventral bony elements of the spinal column. This is an inherently destabilizing procedure that would require significant instrumentation to reestablish the strength and alignment of the normal spine. Accessing the spinal cord from a dorsal approach allows us to remove a minimal amount of bone, in this case, the lamina, through what is termed a laminectomy, to access the spinal cord without causing issues with spinal stability. In this case, I performed what is termed a hemilaminectomy, where I removed only half of the bone along the back of the neck at the two levels overlying the cavernous malformation at C3 and C4. Opening the dura, or covering of the spinal cord, then allows exposure of small ligaments, known as the dentate ligaments, which can be cut and put under gentle traction to twist the spinal cord slightly and bring a ventral lesion, such as this cavernous malformation, into view. This avoids the need for subsequent spinal instrumentation and hardware, and does not put the patient at risk for significant deformity and instability. Let's jump now into our video illustration of the surgery. Here you can see an oblique view of the spinal column, specifically the seven vertebra comprising the cervical spinal column and associated nerve roots exiting through holes in the column known as foramina. Another important consideration is the presence of the vertebral arteries, which run in their own foramina in the sides of the cervical vertebra where they help supply the brainstem and posterior brain. When we examine a cross-section, known as an axial view of the spinal column and spinal cord itself, you can appreciate the presence of a cavernous malformation in the ventrolateral cord. Removal of this malformation through a posterior approach involves a midline incision in the skin of the neck and dissection through an avascular plane between the muscles of the posterior neck, which allows us to come down on the bones of the cervical spine with minimal bleeding. In this case, we focus on exposure of the third and fourth cervical levels, which overlie the cavernous malformation. The box demonstrates the location of the lamina of C3 and C4 on the left. These bones may be removed without causing significant instability to the spinal canal and offer excellent visualization of the posterolateral spinal cord. In this case, the dura, or outer protective layering of the spinal cord, has been opened in a linear fashion and retracted using small sutures. Deep to the dura is a thinner translucent layer of protective tissue known as the arachnoid, which is similarly opened and retracted to the side using small metal clips, which are removed at the conclusion of the procedure. This exposes the dorsolateral cord, including the dorsal rootlets of C3 and C4, which can be appreciated here. Because the cavernous malformation is on the ventrolateral aspect of the cervical cord, the dentate ligaments must be cut and placed under gentle traction to expose the ventral belly of the spinal cord and the cavernous malformation itself. With even a small window, we may carefully and safely enter the spinal cord and remove the cavernous malformation using gentle suction and meticulous dissection with minimal use of cautery to avoid damage to the healthy tracts of the spinal cord. Removing a cavernous malformation in its entirety is important to preventing subsequent hemorrhage and recurrence of the malformation. In part two, you'll see the surgical steps up close as I take you into the operating room with footage from the microscope that demonstrates the beautiful anatomy of the spinal cord and the steps that I take to remove this patient's cavernous malformation. Stay tuned, Brainiacs, and I look forward to seeing you in part two.